Hello, everyone. Welcome to day five and our last day of the Premi Health Talks. I'm Fabiana Bakin, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF, and your host for this event. The Premi Health Talks is the first international live series that CPBF is hosting in 2021. These educational sessions are in collaboration with the Family Integrated Care Committee, the Canadian Association of Neonatal Nurses, the Canadian Neonatal Network, the European Foundation for the Care of New Newborn Infants, EFCNI, and GLANS, the Global Alliance for Newborn Care. For those not familiar with CPBF, we are a charitable organization, and our mission is to empower families of premature babies every step of the way through support and education. We believe that through consistent information, access to helpful resources, and peer support inside and outside an ICU, we can empower families ensuring they are ready to care for their babies. For this premium health talks, we brought health experts from around the world and from all over Canada. We've been diving deep into topics affecting premium health, from breastfeeding to parental mental health during the pandemic, from the importance of kangaroo care to the best practices to protect your baby's skin. If you need closed captioning, you can watch it live from our YouTube channel and enable closed captioning on the screen. I want to thank our sponsors, Medela, Water Wipes, and Prolacta Bioscience for their ongoing support. Please use the comment area below your screen to ask questions, to share your perspective and stories. Today, we have two presentations, one with Diane Schultz talk about kangaroo care, and the second one, I have Misty Williams talking on skin care. And right now, we're going to talk about kangaroo care and COVID-19. May 15th, as many of you might know, is International Kangaroo Care Day. And we have to continue to raise awareness on the importance of kangaroo care for premature babies. Kangaroo care is a form of holding in which a baby is placed on the chest of a parent or other adult in direct skin-to-skin -skin contact. In 1978, a doctor in Colombia who was faced with a shortage of caregivers and a lack of resources he started promoting kangaroo care in his hospital. The babies who were held by the parents thrived. And now the practice of kangaroo care is recognized internationally as a wonderful way to help both babies and their parents. And we need to recognize the importance of skin to skin care, also kangaroo care, during the pandemic and how our NICU family's mental health has been affected due to restricted parental presence. In the NICU, we are building the future. Having parents at the bedside being parents is so needed. Kangaroo care plays a huge part in building that connection within the family. It enables parents to be the most important caregivers. We need to make every effort to keep that connection intact. And I have here joining me live from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Diane Schultz, who is a kangaroo care champion. Diane has been a bedside nurse for 32 years in the NICU at San Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba, where she's been actively, actively involved in improving patient and family care. She's the co-chair for the NICU's Fight Care Committee and sits on many committees at the hospital, aiming to educate all staff on kangaroo care at all levels. She's also a member of the National Fight Care Steering Committee, and co-producer of a safe transfer video for kangaroo care that has been shared internationally. Throughout her career, Diane has been a strong advocate for patients and their families. Diane, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me, Fabiana. It's always great to talk to you. You always share your passion uh, and families absolutely love you. Uh, every time you post something, I see all the parents commenting on how they appreciate you and everything you do for them. So I'm very grateful that we are here today. Talk about kangaroo care you know, in anticipation of International Kangaroo Care Day next week. So let's talk about what happened with kangaroo care and skin to skin over the last year with the pandemic. What have you learned? So uh, across the world, there's been many different di restrictions brought up with COVID. Parents are not allowed to be at the bedside as much as they used to be. I feel family integrated care has been greatly affected by this too, with these restrictions in place. Um, in our unit, we actually were, are pretty liberal compared to some units. We don't restrict our parents to length of time 
but they are not able to be at the bedside together. So it's only one parent at a time. So that does greatly affect all their celebrations at the bedside, receiving bad news at the bedside. And I think it's probably affected the amount of time they do kangaroo care because a lot of our parents would come and sit at the bedside together while one was holding skin to skin or kangaroo care. So I think it has affected it somewhat. We make every effort to uh, encourage and promote kangaroo care, but with all the restrictions in place and orange, red, green levels, it has affected things. Absolutely. Before we continue, because Diane is not gonna have a formal presentation, so you guys can share with us your experiences, ask questions, but I'm gonna share one, first of all, from Lori Romas. Uh, hi from Kenora. Baby Scott says hi to Auntie Diane. We are so fortunate to have her as our nurse. She holds a very special place in our hearts. Thank you, Laurie, for joining us here today. Yeah. And then we Thank also you. have Sarah uh, and Baby Lokram from Barry. We are so excited for today. It has been such a great experience. Thank you for joining us, Sarah. Sarah has been uh, here with us uh, the entire week. Diane, you see how important nurses are for parents and for us to continue to educate parents that way and how important it is for us to continue to educate parents on kangaroo care uh, it's it's so important every parent needs to be fully educated on the benefits of kangaroo care why we do it and that it's important to continue it even when the baby is stable um i was just in a q a this morning with with some other individuals and a lot of times when the baby is more stable in a crib bundled, everyone thinks the way to hold a baby is bundle held. So you can look at your baby. That is one of the uh, disadvantages of skin to skin or kangaroo care is that if you're holding them properly, you actually can't see your baby. But it is so important to, to continue that skin to skin when that baby is stable because you have to make up for all the missed kangaroo care time that they weren't able to do when they were unstable. So there's so much the benefits just continue on forever. Um, basically, until the baby has to be done. So let's talk about the benefits because people might not be aware of all the benefits for kangaroo care. There's several benefits for kangaroo mm -hmm. care. Let's highlight what parents should know about it, but also if there's any healthcare professional here, how important it is to teach the parents on those benefits. Right. So kangaroo care has been highly researched too. If you ever want to, like as a professional, want to see the benefits, you can go on the kangaroo care bibliography that is maintained by Susie Luddington. The practice of kangaroo care or skin to skin is a diaper clad baby held bare chest to bare chest, ventral surface to ventral surface on its caregiver. So it could be a mother, father, grandparent, sibling. There really is no restriction to who the caregiver is. And uh, a comment I've heard is that a bare chest is better than anything. It doesn't matter. So many benefits. Thermoregulation um, is just kind of a given and the mother will automatically thermoregulate that baby with her breasts. Women are hormonally driven. If you put twins on, each breast actually works independently to thermoregulate each twin. And we've talked about this before. We have done triplets and we've never had a thermoregulation problem with, with the triplets either. Brain maturation is huge. And that's because the baby gets good regular sleep when they're in skin to skin, as compared to in the crib, on the open bed, in the, in the isolate. They don't get the same amount of healing REM sleep as they do when, it's, when they're held skin to skin or kangaroo care. And that research has been pr proven many times over. And when you're in that deep REM sleep, you're actually maturing your brain. So the parent is actually growing their child's brain when they're holding them skin to skin. Um, for pain control too, skin to skin and breastfeeding together work better than anything because it actually blunts the pain response in the brain, which reduces your memory of pain, which reduces the trauma that, trauma that you feel afterwards because pain will actually follow you long term. So, and it works better than anything. I know we use sucrose a lot. It works better than sucrose. So I've started many IVs, collected blood work, done heel pokes while baby up in skin to skin. So it's very important again for that caregiver to be at the bedside, helping the team care for that baby. Um, benefits for the mother, it greatly reduces postpartum depression. 
and for the father. Postpartum depression in dads is actually very underreported. They say it's about one in 10, but they still feel that is extremely underreported. And you can, I've had nurses come to me and tell me that they've watched a dad fall in love with their baby by holding them skin to skin and holding a mirror, being able to look at them. So the connection that you lose when you don't do skin to skin uh, actually does more damage. Um, postpartum hemorrhage is reduced for the mom too when you hold skin to skin. It increases breastfeeding rates, duration, and her volume of breast milk too. So there's just so many, so many benefits for us to be doing this. Um, we, in our unit, we do skin to skin on basically every baby other than babies that are actively cooling until they have been rewarmed. We also don't do babies with chest tubes in just because that chest tube can be quite painful to, to move that baby with. And our chest tubes generally do not stay in very long. So we do wait for that. Um, but we generally hold all our babies skin to skin, even if they have a breathing tube in. Many babies we have are on CPAP. We hold them all skin to skin. And we also accommodate the position too, depending on the baby or depending on the caregiver. You can always rearrange the position of the baby to make it work too. Um, so, so I'm going to share comments here because you mentioned having the, the mirror and uh, Sarah said uh, that her nurse would give, give her a mirror so they could see the baby while providing skin to skin. Such a great idea and a great tool. So you can see the baby and it don't, it don't look at the monitor, right? You can see yeah. that the baby's breathing well, everything is okay, and you still see how cute they are and how cozy they feel. Uh, yeah. We have to hear a comment or maybe a question from Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, how do we overcome the ongoing barrier at the bedside? The nurse who tells the parents, it's better not to hold him right now. This makes me so sad that despite all the known benefits, there are nurses who say this and baby as well. It, it's an ongoing issue. You really need champions in your unit. You really need your staff to firmly believe in the benefits for skin to skin. And it takes a long time. We've been going at it now for over 10 years in our unit and it's a continual process. You always have to educate and support the staff. You always have to educate and support your families too, as well as your medical staff too. And our, uh, um, also our respiratory therapists are involved in, in the transfer process too. So it's, it takes a village to do this, but it is an ongoing process. Um, in the session that I was in this morning, one of the people spoke about interviewing a dad who had had a 24 weeker who was on his way getting prepared to go home. He really did not hold that baby. And what the nurse told him was they were giving compassionate neglect to the baby. I just couldn't believe that, she, that the nurse would even say that. Neglect is neglect. It doesn't matter if you think you're doing it compassionately or not. It is not. So we really need to firmly believe one, that the parents are the most important caregiver at the bedside and that they need to connect with that baby. When you separate the baby from its mother, you do cause neurodevelopmental damage. So we should make every effort not to separate the parents from the baby at any time and include them at the bedside. Even if the baby is unstable and not able to be held at that point, there's no reason for them not to be able to hold touch their baby, speak to their baby, sing to their baby, read to their baby. They should always be a presence for that baby. Absolutely. So Wendy uh, added in her comment, our team is awesome, but there are always those outliers who say these things to families. Well, Wendy, I can say yes, because I, when my son was also in hospital for five months, I, I had those conversations. It's better not to hold him today. Uh, so Tanya, here comment, hi Tanya. Do you skin to skin with babies on high frequency? That is such a great question. Diane, yeah. the village that you need for that moment to happen. So I'm assuming she means the jet ventilator. Yes, we do. So um, it is, again has taken us a process. And when we went to Bogota for the International Kangaroo Care Mother, Mother Day Conference, I'm saying it wrong, Somebody from the Scandinavian countries got up and spoke and she said, you can't get good at something you don't do. Mm -hmm. So you're not gonna get good at it if you don't do it and keep on doing it. And I use the, that term for mothers that are breastfeeding too. 
because you can't attempt a breastfeed one time and then be good at it or have the baby be good at it. It's a practice. It's a learning all the time. So we do teach our staff all levels of care, how to transfer those babies in skin to skin kangaroo care, and we practice it. We did create that video. Um, when we do babies on the jet or any baby that is intubated, we only do the nurse transfer, which is a sandwich transfer. And then we have at least three people, sometimes four people, sometimes five people involved in the transfer. We have a briefing beforehand with the parent. We make sure that everyone knows that if they're uncomfortable anytime during the process, they can stop or halt the process. We will correct what is going on and then continue. And then we try and do a debriefing afterwards too, just to make sure that we talk our way through it and what has gone well, what hasn't. Since we've actually started doing the nurse transfer with our intubated babies, we haven't, I, I like to say, I think it's been one, but I don't think we've had a baby extubate during the transfer process. So it's not impossible. You just have to think your way through it, go slow, and for sure, have a look at the video. It, it is a, a simulation for the first half. We didn't want to use our actual unstable patients for the transfer of the, in the video. So we used uh, recessed dolls and we borrowed some parents to do the to do the simulation part and then we used real babies at the end of it that were more stable. So, but yeah, we do all our, we do our babies on the jet. So I'm sharing here that URL is a, is a very long one, but you can take a screenshot of this. The video is there. It is a great video. Um, Diane, talk a little bit more about this video. Uh, can any hospital apply the techniques that you share in this video? I saw this video in a conference when you presented It's about 20 minutes long and there's so much great information there. Can this be applied in any unit? I don't see why not. Every unit is different. We are a unit that has pods. We don't have single patient rooms. So we actually are very restricted with space at the bedside and we're able to do it with our very sick babies. So I don't see why any unit couldn't do it. Again, it's practice. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a lot of trial and error in the very beginning when we really started to increase our skin to skin kangaroo to care time. And we learned a lot from doing it. But I learn every time I transfer a baby because every baby is an individual. Every parent is an individual. So every time I transfer a baby, there's always something to learn from it. You just want to make sure that you do it as safe as possible, but I, for sure any unit could do it. Okay, so let's share some of the pictures that we, you share with us. Um, because here you have a picture of baby on a ventilator. Oh, so talk about those pictures. And let me know which when I need to move from the next slide, because I think those pictures are so important for everyone to see what is possible when there is a willingness and a team uh, work happening in your unit. Yeah, so this is Owen. I, I think the second picture is, well, it is him again, but he's on CPAP, yeah. So um, this was before I think we started doing the nurse transfer for the intubated babies. And we actually had our parents do the transfer for our intubated babies, but then we thought, if something were to go wrong, if the baby did extubate, we didn't want the parents to feel that it was their fault or they caused some part of that. So we thought it was more stable for us because we handle these babies more. And if the mother has had a fresh C-section or if they're nervous in any way, you don't want it to be a bad experience. You want it to be a really good experience. So um, we started to work more with our transfer technique once the baby is extubated, generally those parents are that much more comfortable in handling their baby and they're more willing and more able to do the parent transfer where they actually pick up the baby. We still assist them, but it's it's a different type of transfer. Okay. So, and Owen, I wanna say was born at 25 weeks, yeah. And here you have another parent on CPAP. Yeah, so, and these are our chairs. And there's our mom with the mirror too. So we do have a mirror at every bedside for each parent. I really wish we had some sort of bracket to go on our chairs because again, we're only allowed to have one parent at the bedside. We, what we have done in the past is when we had both parents there, 
one parent would hold the mirror for the other one. So now our parents are having to hold the mirror too. And sometimes it's it gets a little uncomfortable. So it would be handy. We're trying to think of a way that we could actually devise something so we could hold the mirror beside the mother and or the caregiver and the baby. Okay, and I brought this picture. Oh. Actually, me holding Gabriel on a high frequency ventilator. And that was the first time I actually held him on ventilator because he was on CPAP before. Um, and as Diane said, it, will, it took a team to do that. I remember that day it was probably four or five people around us. And I remember the RT holding the tube so I could actually breathe because obviously I was so nervous about this that I, I stopped breathing <laughs> because I was like, okay, what if I extubate Gabriel accidentally? Uh, mm -hmm. But it was such an important moment and he was so very sick uh, on, on those days, especially that day when I took that, we, they took that picture. So it's so important for parents and those things that we always remember, like how, you know, that feeling of holding baby skin to skin and the warmth mm -hmm. and, you know, it just calms you down as a parent. Yeah, it decreases everyone's cortisol. So it, it really calms everybody down. So, yeah, it, no, it's, it's very important to do. Some babies in our unit I know have had to wait weeks to be held just because of different situations. Mm -hmm. um, and it does, it does take a village to transfer the baby. But it's interesting with some of our babies, those parents become the experts in the transfer technique and they watch everything that you do. So if you're new to the baby and you come on to transfer this baby, the parent will actually tell you, no, this is how we do it and it actually works this way. So skin to skin kangaroo care actually does really empower the, the parent because it's something that only they can do. We can't do it as staff. Absolutely. Yeah. Diane, let's talk about tips for parents who are going to hold kangaroo care because sometimes you spend an hour, two hours on the chair, going to the washroom before, pumping before. What do you suggest and recommend to parents? Yeah. So before we hold, we do have a conversation. We recommend that they use the washroom facilities prior to have a snack, have something to drink if, if they need to do that. Certainly pump breast milk because once you're in the chair, I have had mums actually pump while holding skin to skin, but that was when we had a dad at the bedside too. So with the with our parents being there by themselves, it's important if you're, because you don't want to become engorged or leak all over the place. So it's important for our mums to pump beforehand too. Um, make sure that if you have pain, that you take something for, for pain control too prior. So for babies born less than 33 weeks, we really, in our unit, we push for a minimum of 60 minutes, mm -hmm. just so that baby will go through a complete sleep cycle. And it's, it's, it does take a process for them to come out, and it's the longer time. We've had parents sit in the chair for six to eight hours, and we can do care for that baby while that, that baby is on the caregiver too. So they actually recommend babies born less than 33 weeks, or cor even corrected less than 33 weeks, to stay out for a good 70 to 90 minutes because their sleep cycle takes longer. 33 weeks and above, the sleep cycle is about 60 minutes. But in the research, it actually states that even 20 minutes of skin to skin kangaroo care is beneficial. So you just wanna make sure that that parent is able to sit in the chair. We do have specific chairs for holding skin to skin. We recline them. You should always be about at least 30 degrees off of midline reclined. It's easier for the baby to breathe and it uh, is decreases blood pooling for the mother in her legs too. But we get them all comfy. We prop them up with towels or gowns underneath their arms because your arms will get tired holding. You want to make sure that they're as comfortable as possible so they can sit there as long as possible. But yeah, you can change a diaper while that baby is out skin to skin. We feed all our babies while they're out skin to skin. So there's many things that you can do while the baby is being held. Okay, let's talk about chairs because there's a lot of uh, hospitals that we don't have the right chairs to do kangaroo care. So I heard this not only in Canada, but in other places we do a lot of work with international organizations. But I should tell you a few years ago, I did go to Bogota and I did visit a public hospital uh, in Bogota and they have those white pool chairs, you know, the little plastic white chair that we sit here outside and moms are doing kangaroo care on that chair. I, obviously it's not as comfortable, but it's doable. Yeah, 
before we got any type of recliner chair, we did have hard wipeable chairs that our parents would sit in. And we had one mom who held her baby on the jet for six hours the very first time in one of those hard, uncomfortable chairs. So it's amazing what our parents will do. But we do have uh, the Fuma recliners. I don't know if I can say that, but that's, that's the chair that we use. They're made specifically for hospitals. They work very well. They recline, they lock. They're good up to 310 pounds and they're fully wipeable too. Okay, so Diane, now with all these restrictions happening in hospitals around the world, and we know, you know, the kangaroo care is not happening in the same way it was happening before. So what do you recommend hospitals to do at this time? When there's so many restrictions and one parent at a time in a lot of hospitals, uh, one parent full stop. So wh what do you recommend hospitals or parents do? Well, in my ideal world, it would be something totally different than what's going on. Every hospital, every province, every country has so many different restrictions. Like even our country, every province is different in their restrictions and the restrictions for parents at the bedside. It would be amazing if we could have both parents at the bedside with no time restrictions. That would be, be before COVID happened, we were already in semi lockdown because of RSV and only parents were allowed in anyways. So I think it would make a huge difference if you could have both parents at the bedside together and with no time restrictions. Absolutely. So we have a question here from Sherry. Uh, Sherry, thank you for joining us. Should be there anything done differently when babies brought home? In terms of kangaroo care, I assume, or holding the way you hold the baby home? I'm assuming kangaroo care. So you can certainly do kangaroo care skin to skin once you're discharged at home. Again, kangaroo care skin to skin does come with um, safety issues. You always wanna make sure that you're safe when you're doing it. Um, in our unit, our babies are monitored when they're doing it. So mm -hmm. we know if something goes wrong, but we also watch our families while they're holding in skin to skin. Our postpartum parents are taught that when you're doing skin to skin in the hospital, the partner is there with you monitoring you. Because your oxytocin goes up, which is your cuddle hormone, which makes you very sleepy and tired. So it's not uncommon to fall asleep when you're doing skin to skin. We've had many parents in our unit fall asleep during skin to skin, but we monitor them. Out on the ward and at home, it's something different. So you always wanna make sure that you're safe. There are many um, different types of baby wraps shirts that can be used you just want to make sure that you're very safe when you do it that the baby has an open airway it's in slightly sniffing position and that you're safe but really i know there is some school of thought out there that term babies don't need skin to skin but we actually do our term babies at at deliveries for the first hour to two hours prior to the first feed in skin to skin so it's highly beneficial Right, so I, I posed some questions to our audience if they want to answer, if they did kangaroo care, if they had to hold, uh, to wait until uh, somebody offered to hold, for them to hold their babies. So if you want to share with us your thoughts, would be great. In the meantime, I want to share some of the resources that we have here, what Diane was talking about, how to save you do kangaroo care, what is kangaroo care. And if you cannot do kangaroo care, Diane, what are the options for parents? Because we always talk about um touch the baby or put a hand on the baby um and i also want to while you talk about that i want to also share this pdf that we created for kangaroo care that you can is you can download from our website and share with parents there's great information and everything that what diane was talking about is on this pdf here yeah okay shall i leave the contact here so what can how can parents to touch the baby, Diane, in a safe way for the baby, because we know the baby so, you know, sometimes is very sick um, or is so very sensitive. So how can they safely touch the baby and how? Right. Through the incubator, so share some tips with us. So we also do hand hugging if the baby is unable to come out at the present time. The parents should always have their hands in the portholes. To me, you should never have a parent sitting at the bedside staring at their baby. They're, 
I cannot imagine a time when you shouldn't be able to touch your baby. A lot of times we recommend to parents that they don't rub, but hold your hands comforting the baby, cupping their head, cupping their torso, speaking to them softly, singing to them, reading to them. Always, the baby should always know when you're there too. I always encourage the parents to open up the portholes, let them know that the baby is, let the baby know that they're there, speak to them, touch them. Human touch is so important and they're actually doing studies now on adults and human touch. So it's actually kind of going full circle. Absolutely. Actually, I was reading something yesterday uh, that somebody posted on Twitter, how important it is sometimes when you go into surgery to have a nurse touching and holding your hand in that moment you are so scared and anxious and the benefits of having a healthcare professional touching the patient going for surgery. It's fascinating, right? As human beings, of course, we need the touch, we need the contact and obviously this is so very important for our babies. There's a, a comment here from Sarah that her uh, low clone was born at 30 weeks, uh, weighing just over 1,100 uh, grams. And the first night I met him, the nurse offered me to hold him. I was so scared, but so beautiful. That is absolutely right. The, you are scared, but it is a moment that you never forget. Yeah, you shouldn't, the parents also shouldn't have to ask to hold their baby. That should be something that is an automatic. And if the baby is uh, not able to be held at that time, then the conversation should be, what can we do to enable this baby to come out and be held? We should always be thinking about, because when we have a baby that's intubated, the conversation is always, when can we get the tube out? Or if the baby has central lines, the conversation is always, when can we get the lines out? But the conversation is never, when can that baby come out and be held? And if not, what do we need to enable that baby to be held? Nice. So, yeah. Uh, Diane, let's talk about the negative implications of not holding the baby or not touching the baby. So I always kind of think of those orphanages in Russia where the babies were never held and then people adopted them and those babies had never been held. So, and they're actually doing studies on adults now with dementia and human touch. So there's many things. It, 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 it is just so comforting when you hold your baby, comforting for the baby, comforting for the parent. And it just, it makes that family a unit. It just connects that whole family together. And unfortunately during COVID too, there are no other people that are allowed into the unit, at least not in our place, it's just the parents. So that has made a very, a lot of restriction too, because those grandparents that can't come in and see their grandchild, so, yeah, no, human touch plays. It, it is a very sad situation right now that we see and sometimes, you know, baby passed away, the grandparents don't meet the grandchild. It's, it's devastating. And we've been talking about uh, parental presence in the ICU during the pandemic all along. We have a publication, a lot of advocacy, and it's unfortunate that this is still happening over a year later. But Diane, let's talk about your experience uh, in Colombia. You went to Colombia to learn and teach them what you do here. You shared the video there. So what was your experience of going to Colombia where Kangaroo Care was actually born and what did you bring back? It was amazing to go there actually. We toured a, a hospital and a clinic too. And it was just amazing because it was just every day. This is what, this is what the parents do. They carry their babies around skin to skin. And a lot of them, because of, I guess, their altitude, a lot of those babies go home on oxygen. Mm -hmm. And in the clinic, we saw mothers coming in for follow-up visits, carrying behind them this tank of oxygen with the baby, but the baby was held skin to skin. In the clinic, we met one couple who the mom was holding skin to, and breastfeeding too is just commonplace. It's not hidden, it's just what they do. It's how they raise their children. But we met this one couple and the dad was so excited to meet us. He took the baby and placed the baby skin to skin and talked us through it. So it's just what they do. It's their culture. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something that we really need to work towards that making family unit, family holding, baby holding, kangaroo care, skin to skin, that it's just what happens. In our hospital too, we do skin to skin it's protocol at our cesarean sections. 
And that we've been doing that almost four years now. So you can really see the difference in some things with the, with the mother. You can see a difference in the blood loss. I've had many babies latch and breastfeed while they're closing mom up in the OR. So you actually have changed a surgical procedure into a family event. So wow. there's so many things. Yeah. That is really amazing. So, but let's talk, when we are preparing for this talk, you were talking about the privacy and if the father or the mom feels comfortable ripping the shirt off in front of the yeah. staff. So let's talk about that because I think this is something important and it varies by cultural and where you are, your values. So I think it's important to bring it up. And so staff is also aware that those sensitivities. Yeah. So when we first started, I was so I was one of the hot dogs. I was so gung ho. I was like, no, we're doing this. It's like, no, there's no reason why not. It's like, get your shirt off. Doesn't matter who you are. We would pull the curtains. But as we progressed in the last couple of years, I've really started to wonder and, and worry about our families because so many people have experienced trauma in their life. They might and different cultures are not comfortable in undressing in front of other people. So we have to be very aware that that is another question you need to have with either caregiver, mother or father, because both of them, one of them could be uncomfortable. It doesn't matter if, it, if it's a male or a female. So that's another conversation that you should have with them. It's like, I will pull the curtain, I will step out. Generally what our parents do is they, re, if they have a button down shirt, then they can open up the shirt. Of course, no bra. But generally what we do is we have a hospital gown open at the front. So our parents will change behind the curtain. So you do need to be respectful of people's privacy and where they're coming from to make sure that they're comfortable with this. In our unit, we do open the curtains once the baby is in skin to skin position and parents are covered up just because we need to be able to monitor that baby. But so we inform them of that too. But we always make every effort to make sure that our parents are fully covered and be respectful of where they're coming from. And you still have some dads who will whip off their shirts wherever. And it's like, now we're like, well, let me pull the curtain. But <laughs> they're comfortable, they're comfortable. Um, and even some of our moms was like, well, everyone's seen it all so anyway. So it's, but you do really need to be respectful of people's cultures and where they're coming from. So that needs to be part of the conversation. As important as it, as kangaroo care skin to skin is, we do need to be very mindful of the the safety and comfort of our parents. Absolutely, so very important. Yeah. Diane, in, in regular times, you would be in a full force in, into the kangaroo challenge. Yeah. A couple so, of years now, it's been very challenging to do the challenge because of COVID. So give us a little bit of history of the kangaroo challenge and the International Kangaroo Care Day. So the Kangaroo Carathon actually started through Sunnybrook, um, I want to say about eight years ago, and we had participated probably five or six. And it was a two week long Kangarooathon where you would monitor all kangaroo care skin to skin time held in those two weeks. And every unit was different. Each year Sunnybrook would put out a separate challenge for that. Sunnybrook was unable to do it last year. Um, some places still are doing the kangaroo-a-thon. We did do it last year, but this year we're just celebrating the one day. May 15th is International Kangaroo Care Day. So we are going to celebrate that day. We'll have meals provided for our parents. There will be prizes. Um, there will be things put up on the walls. So it will be a celebration. It's really just to celebrate and recognize and keep people motivated to maintain the practice of skin to skin and kangaroo care. That's so important. And also that Dr. Michael Narvi from the Health Science oh, Center in yeah. Winnipeg, he's a big kangaroo care advocate. He actually has a kangaroo costume that he wears around the unit during this time. And he's on uh, all his social media uh, at the moment, him dressed as a kangaroo. Uh, Dr. Michael Narvi, you got to check it out. It's really, uh, it's really cool, right? So like everybody get engaged. That, uh, it reinforced the importance of that practice. So I want to share a couple of more comments here from our audience. Lori said, when she was allowed to see her baby, kangaroo care was offered. The frontline and ICU nurses were so supportive. Thank you for sharing that, Lori. Lori was in the ICU in the very early days of the pandemic. 
uh, actually the first week of the pandemic and uh, there mm -hmm. was a lot of restrictions for her there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also Sarah is sharing here why uh, her baby was on CPAP, the nurse always did the transfer. But once she was off, I was able to complete the transfer myself and it was such an amazing feeling. I felt so empowered. It gave me some sense of normality. Wow, Sarah, this is so important. Thank you for sharing that. Right, how we empower parents to do things, right? Yeah, and it's so easy for our parents not to feel empowered. Our parents are coming into a strange area with strangers caring for their newborn baby. This is not what they planned for. This is not what they envisioned. So for our parents to actually speak up and ask for things, I think would be very rare and very hard to do. And more like fantastic if they are, but that's our job. It's really our, our job to enable our parents to be that advocate and support for that baby. They're the ones that are going to be taking this baby home. They're the ones creating the future. They're the ones shaping future societies, not us. I may be there resuscitating a baby with a team, but I'm not the most important caregiver there. It's the parents that are, and we really need to support that and believe in that. Absolutely. Diane, that is so beautiful. I think that summarize everything that you said today in, in this talk because so important. And I'm hoping next year we are here talking about the kangaroo -athon and which hospital is taking the lead, or which parent is taking the lead on kangaroo care. So let's stay positive that we have a different scenario next year. Yeah, Diane, we'll you any thoughts for our audience today? Um, if you can just speak for your baby when you're at the bedside. Don't be afraid to ask. All they can say is no, but you got to keep asking. Even if it's scary, you got to keep asking because you need to hold your baby. It is so important. Absolutely. And I'm just yeah. sharing again the CPBF website with all the information for Kangaroo Care. Uh, Diane, but thank you so much for joining us here today. Always a pleasure talking to you. I love to feel your passion and your commitment to these families. You bring so much joy to the life of those families. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Thank you, Fabiana. Thank you. And for all of you watching us here live from uh, YouTube or Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back in just a few minutes with Miss Williams talking about evidence-based neonatal skincare practices. And I want to thank our sponsors, Medilla, Water Wipes, and Prolacta Bioscience for their ongoing support. CPBF is a charitable organization, and 100% of all donations received this week will go to our support programs for families. To donate, you can go to our canadianpremi.org website. I'm trying to find the link here. And uh, stay tuned, and I'll be back in just a few minutes. Thank you.
everyone. Welcome back. If this is your first uh, talk of the day, welcome to the Premi Health Talks. I'm Fabiana Bakin, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation, CPBF, and your host for this event. The Premi Health Talks is the first international live series that CPBF is hosting in 2021. These educational sessions are in collaboration with the Family Integrated Care Committee, the Canadian Association of New NATO Nurses, the Canadian New NATO Network, the European Foundation for the Care of Newborn Infants, EFCNI, and GLANS, the Global Alliance for Newborn Care. For those not familiar with CPBF, we are a charitable organization, and our mission is to empower families of premature babies every step of the way through support and education. We believe that through consistent information, access to helpful resources, and peer support inside and outside the NICU, we can empower families, ensuring they are ready to care for their babies. For this Premi Health Talks, we brought health experts from around the world and all over Canada. We've been diving deep into topics affecting Premi Health, from breastfeeding to parental mental health, from the importance of kangaroo care and the best practices to protect your baby's skin. If you need closed captioning, you can watch it live from our YouTube channel and enable closed captioning on the screen. I want to thank our sponsors, Medilla, Water Wipes, and Prolacta uh, from their own, for their ongoing support. Please use the comment area below your screen to ask questions, to share your perspectives and your stories. Today, we already had one session with Diane Schultz on kangaroo care. And if you miss a session, you can watch on our YouTube channel. And next week, all the sessions from this week will be available on our website. And right now, we are going to talk about evidence-based neonatal skincare practices. We'll talk about the latest recommendations for neonatal skincare for preterm and term babies as related to cleansers, bathing, cord care, perineal care, emollients, and oils. And I have here with me joining live from Arkansas, the U.S., uh, Miss Williams. And Miss uh, has been involved in neonatal nursing for the past 16 years and is certified as a high-risk neonatal intensive care nurse. She's currently the Advanced Practice Partner 2 for the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Her current role includes providing theory and evidence-based knowledge to shape practice and core competencies for neonatal staff, professional development, regulatory compliance, oversight of nurses' sensitive quality indicators, and performance improvement. Nisi has a special interest in mentoring and professional development. She serves on the National Association of Neonatal Nurses Professional Development Committee and is the president-elect of the Arkansas Association of Neonatal Nurses. Nisi, thank you so much for joining us here today. I'm glad to join you. It's so great to have you. So I know you have a presentation to share with us. Uh, we'll share the, your slides uh, today. And after your presentation, you have a, uh, some time for Q&A. So please send your questions uh, to me, and you're going to address them at the end of the presentation. Here they All righty, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. We're basically just going to be talking about some evidence-based neonatal skincare practices. Um, and then following this presentation, hopefully you'll be able to discuss why premature skin is predisposed to disruptions in skin integrity. We're going to review some recent literature of evidence-based skin care practices for preterm and term infants. And we're going to talk about those latest recommendations for neonatal skin care, as Fabiana described, for cleansers, bathing, cord care, perineal care, emollients, oils, and other skin care products. So first we need to do a little dive into some background. Uh, go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So we're gonna talk about the epidermis first. This is our outermost skin layer. And it normally consists of four to five cell layers. The stratum corneum is the outermost layer. And when mature, it's about 20, 10 to 20 layers thick. And it provides barrier functions. So this includes preventing trans-epidermal water loss and also eva evaporative hypothermia. And it also provides protections from microbes and toxins. Next slide. 
Um, so the epidermis of premature infants is different than that of a term infant or of an adult. So the stratum corneum, that outermost layer, is underdeveloped. And in extremely low birth weight infants, it can be less than two to three layers thick. Um, this um, results in an easy removal of the epidermal layer and also um, reduces barrier function for any infant who's born at less than 34 weeks gestation. This places our premature infants at risk for multiple adverse outcomes. They are at increased risk for greater permeability by noxious agents. They have an increased risk for transepidermal water loss. They have an increased risk for allergen sensitization. They have delayed skin maturation, and then they're at increased risk for skin damage to, from any chemical, mechanical devices, or adhesive-related products, and it also places them at increased risk for infection. Next slide. So the dermis is the next layer of skin, and it's connected to the epidermis by elastic fibers. <coughs> Excuse me. However, in premature infants, they have weaker, fewer, and more widely spaced elastic fibers. They have decreased collagen, and they're also more predisposed to tissue edema. And any tissue edema further weakens the bonds between the epidermal layer and the dermal layer. So they have decreased skin elasticity, and then it increases the risk of skin injury and blistering. Next. So every infant, regardless of gestational age, <coughs> undergoes a skin maturation process. And this occurs through a skin acidification, and it occurs independently of gestational age at birth. So the sweat and oil that are naturally occurring form an acid mantle. The skin pH will lower from a range of 6 to 7 at birth to 5.5 in the first week, and then further drops to five by three weeks of age. The sweat and oil will form that acid mantle and it will protect against some microorganisms as well as reduces transepidermal water loss. By about two to three weeks of age, the barrier function of preterm infants is similar to term infants. Next. So what are the issues? What what things are we looking at when we're talking about skin care and interventions with neonates? Well, after having talked about the epidermis and the dermis, you can see why skin care maintenance and interventions are not without risk in this population. So some of the potential adverse outcomes, some of which we've already talked about, are hospital-acquired infections, allergen sensitization, toxic absorption of chemicals, altered skin appearance, and then in addition to that, infant skin care guidelines are inconsistent and there have been no published guidelines for premature infants. Um, critically ill infants also face additional challenges. Um, so one of the quotes that I like from Kohler says, the goal of evidence-based newborn skin care should be to preserve integrity, prevent toxicity, and avoid exposure of the skin to harmful chemical agents. So what we're gonna talk about is basically a literature review that I did um, looking at articles and asking the question, in preterm and term infants, what are the latest evidence-based skincare guidelines? So this search was of multiple medical databases, um, that looked at skincare guidelines and infants. The articles were filtered to only include those that were published within the last five years that were full text articles. And it excluded some specific items such as kangaroo care, um, which while it does involve skin is not specific to skincare practices. Um, and after all of that, and after comparing what were duplicative items and reading the abstracts, 12 articles were selected to be included in this literature review. Next. So the first article we're going to talk about is infant skincare products. What are the issues? 
So this was a literature review, and the goal of this article was to provide evidence-based information to educate parents on the use of products for preterm and term infants. Next. And what the authors found was that there was little scientific evidence to support the safety of natural or organic products on infant skin. And this was due to the fact that the origination of raw materials from different sources made it difficult to test and then compare ingredients. There's also an abundance of non-scientific information, which makes it challenging for parents to navigate choices when they're looking at various products. Uh, compared to soaps and detergents, cleansers formulated for infant skin do not disrupt the infant's acid mantle or skin barrier. And oils lower in oleic acid content have a lower risk of irritant contact dermatitis. The next article that we're going to look at is Extremely Preterm Infant Skin Care, a Transformation of Practice Aimed to Prevent Harm. This was a quality improvement project and the authors described a harm prevention or consequence centered approach to skincare to help facilitate safer practice methods for extremely premature infants. What the authors found was that current literature for skincare of extremely premature infants was scarce. However, they were able to extract some clinical practice pearls and apply them to their NICU to promote safer skincare practices. The next article we're going to talk about is Infant Skin Care Updates and Recommendations. The purpose of this article was to review some research updates and current skin care recommendations for term infants, preterm infants, as well as any infants born with genetic skin disorders. Next, what the authors found was that delaying the first bath offers multiple benefits for term infants that swaddle bathing every four days for preterm infants is an effective strategy, and that infants with a family history of atopic dermatitis benefit from regular application of a bland skin moisturizer. The next article we're going to look at is evidence-based skin care in preterm infants. Uh, this was a literature review, the purpose of which to, was to address skin barrier maintenance in preterm, very preterm, and extremely preterm infants. And what the authors found was that plastic wraps, humidified incubators, air drying the umbilical cord, and tub bathing every fourth day were supported. However, there was conflicting information about the use of emollients. In developed countries, topical petroleum resulted in increased rates of candidemia and coagulase negative staphylococcus infection. However, in developing countries, preterm infants exhibited reduced um, nosocomial or inquired infections, and they had improved skin conditions. Next, we're going to look at bathing and beyond current bathing controversies for newborn infants. This was a literature review, and they reviewed the literature about newborn bathing as well as the controversies of daily CHG baths for NICU patients. What the author found was that delaying the first bath after delivery offers multiple benefits, including improved breastfeeding, that tub bathing maintains temperature better and is less stressful than other methods, that premature bath infants can be bathed as infrequently as every four days without an increase in skin colonization. Next, we're going to look at the recommendations from a European Roundtable meeting on best practice healthy infant skin care. These were European Roundtable recommendations, and this was an update from material that was originally published in 2009 in light of new evidence. And what the authors found, and there's too many recommendations to list here um, individually, was, um, for example, they changed their recommendation from wiping the infant with water immediately after delivery to the infant can be wiped preferably with a dry towel. And they changed the wording of healthcare workers wearing gloves during the first bath from should to ideal. Um, however, this um, is against um, CDC recommendations, which recommend that gloves should always be worn as standard precautions 
when it's reasonably anticipated that contact with blood or other potentially infectious material is going to occur. The authors also listed the evidence strength for many of their recommendations as low quality. Next, we're going to look at umbilical cord care in the newborn infant. This was a clinical report, and the purpose was to review the evidence supporting recommendations of umbilical cord care in different clinical settings. The author found that Authors found that the umbilical cord should be cut with a sterile blade or scissors, preferably using sterile gloves, that dry cord care is preferable under most circumstances in high-resource countries, that application of topical chlorhexidine is recommended for those born outside the hospital setting where hygienic conditions are poor and or where infection rates are high. Next, we're going to look at skin care practices in newborn nurseries and mother baby units in Maryland. This was a survey of skin care practices in newborn nurseries and mother baby units. And then they then took those survey results and assessed them against a literature review. And this helped them to evaluate current practice and then provide a summary of recommendations based upon that analysis of the current literature. What the authors found was they able to get a very large response and um, they received responses from over 90% of the nurseries. A lot of their questions centered around bathing, removal of the vernix um, after delivery and skincare products. And what the authors found was that the practice varied among various hospitals and it was often not evidence-based or in fact was contrary to the literature. Next, we're going to look at neonatal skin care, developments in care to maintain neonatal barrier function and prevention of diaper dermatitis. This was a literature review um, to evaluate current practice and provide a summary of recommendations based upon analysis of the current literature. What the authors found was that superabsorbent diapers reduce moisture in the incidence of diaper dermatitis that barrier creams aid in prevention and treatment of diaper dermatitis, but do not replace the need for frequent diaper changes. Um, and current literature did not support one cleansing method over another. Next, um, a quality improvement approach to perineal skincare. This was the use of standardized guidelines and novel diaper wipes to reduce diaper dermatitis in NICU infants. This is a quality improvement project um, the authors implemented perineal skincare guidelines, which included novel diaper wipes to decrease the incidence of diaper dermatitis by 20% within one year. And what the authors found was that the incidence of diaper dermatitis decreased by 16.7%. The incidence of severe diaper dermatitis decreased by 34.9% and the duration of severe diaper dermatitis decreased from 6.1 to 2.6 days per, per 100 patient days. And there was not a subsequent increase in uh, fungal skin infections during this time. Next, we're gonna look at the basics, which was the Baby Skin Integrity Comparison Survey Study. This was a prospective experimental study, and the authors um, designed it to compare three different brands of baby wipes, and they used maternal observations of the incidence of irritant diaper dermatitis in infants from birth to eight weeks of age. What the authors found was that babies who were cleaned with the brand with fewest ingredients had significantly fewer days of rash. The first, this was the first research of its kind, which revealed that different formulations of baby wipes can impact the skin integrity of infants, and there was a highly significant brand effect noted. Next, we're going to look at topical emollients for preventing infection in preterm infants. This was a Cochrane review to assess the effect of topical application of emollients on the incidence of invasive infection in preterm infants. What the authors found was that there was 18 eligible primary publications included, and in that there was a total of 3,089 infants which participated in the trials. There was no evidence of a difference in incidence of invasive infection or mortality. 
So what are we going to do with all this information? How do we synthesize that together? Together. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So for cleansers, what their research supported was that we should use a liquid mild formulation for infants with a pH of four to seven. The use of soaps or detergents is highly discouraged as their alkaline nature can disrupt that skin's acid mantle, resulting in roughness, dryness, and flaking of the skin. You should use a product with minimal dyes and fragrances. And for infants who are born at less than 20 Uh, we lost uh, Misty's audio. I'll be back in a just a few minutes as soon as we recover her audio. Stay with us. Okay. I don't know where we cut off at. I'll repeat the last part. So um, ocular safety is an important consideration, and this is because infants do not readily blink to protect their eyes until they're about four months of age. So bathing frequency. What the research supported was that delaying the first bath until 12 to 24 hours of life is beneficial for healthy term infants or is culturally appropriate. This increases parental bo bonding and breastfeeding success, and it helps retain the vernix caseosa. Um, however, bathing earlier may be indicated in cases of heavy meconium staining, excessive blood, um, or in the presence of some maternal infections. Um, however, you want to ensure that temperature and cardiorespiratory status should be stable prior to the first bath. Um, the retention of this vernix caseosa has multiple benefits for the infant, including protection from infection. It also contributes to the development of the acid mantle barrier and helps improve skin barrier function. Research also supports that bathing two to three times per week is sufficient and additional bathing can actually disrupt skin barrier function and increase bacterial skin flora. So next we want to talk about bathing methods. So tub bathing is preferred over sponge bathing, especially for preterm infants. It's less likely to cause body temperature variability. It helps minimize the physiological stress associated with bathing. Uh, swaddle bathing can also help reduce intense motor reactions seen during bathing. And immersion bathing prior to cord separation has also been found to be safe. So for CHG bathing, the research found that daily CHG bathing does support um, the reduction of bloodstream infections. However, there's a lack of research and information about whether CHG crosses the blood-brain barrier, um, and there's an unknown neurotoxicity or neurological impact. Um, studies have shown that after uh, topical exposure to low concentrations, that preterm infants who were greater than 1,500 grams and greater than seven days old had demonstrated detectable serum levels from systemic absorption. And the risk for systemic absorption is higher in preterm infants with poor skin integrity. So there's definitely more research that's needed in this area. Next, we're gonna talk about umbilical cord care. So you always wanna to try to keep the cord clean and dry. The umbilical cord can be a common entry point for pathogenic bacteria with Staphylococcus aureus being the most frequently reported organism. Um, antibacterial, antimicrobial agents in the hospital setting are not recommended, and this is because reducing bacterial colonization can actually lead to the selection of more virulent bacterial pathogens. Instead, you want to expose the umbilical cord to air or loosely cover it with a cloth. If it becomes soiled, you can clean it with soap and sterile water. 
You want to fold the diaper down below the cord. And you can promote colonization of non-pathogenic bacteria by allowing the healthy infant to room in and be colonized with the mother's normal skin flora. And next we're going to talk about diaper dermatitis. So this is a broad term used to describe inflamed skin and lesions in the diaper area. Um, and this is a common area that you see um, rashes develop because it's subject to urine, feces, friction, microbes, and then chemicals from skincare products. It can vary in severity, but the majority is classified as irritant contact dermatitis. And infants who have diaper dermatitis often display emotional and physical distress. This can include behavioral changes such as increased crying, agitation, and changes in feeding and sleep patterns. So how frequently do we see diaper dermatitis? It's actually very common. Um, estimates in the literature range from 25 to 100% of infants prior to age two will experience diaper dermatitis, and the reported incidence in the NICU varies from 21 to 25%. Um, infants who receive antibiotics or on fortified diets or have prenatal exposure to illicit drugs also have an increased risk of diaper dermatitis, and this is due to altered gut flora, stool composition, and an increase in stooling frequency. So how can we prevent diaper dermatitis? Uh, the use of super absorbent diapers, this helps reduce moisture at the skin level, changing the diaper frequently, gently removing any urine or stool as friction can disrupt the skin layers and actually cause more damage. Uh, disposable diaper wipes have been shown in multiple studies to be superior to cotton wool and water because the pH buffers in the wipes may actually counteract the alkaline urine and restore normal skin pH. They're also appropriate for medically stable NICU patients, um, but they should be free of any potential irritants such as alcohol, fragrance, essential oils, soaps, and harsh detergents. Uh, barrier creams are an effective element of full-term infant skin management. Uh, zinc and petroleum-based products are the most effective. Um, they're controversial, however, in extreme premature infants due to the risk for systemic absorption, and they're often used to treat diaper dermatitis. Emollients are topical agents usually made of fat or oil that are designed to soften and smooth the skin. They help inhibit water loss, but they may contain fragrances or other skin sensitizing agents. So some recommendations for their usage are to apply in a thin layer, avoiding any skin folds. Do not double dip the product. So if you're applying them, um, get product out of the container, apply it to the infant. Once you've touched the infant, don't go back into the container um, to get more product. Um, this is beneficial for infants with structural skin changes, such as dryness or flaking, those who have a family history of eczema or atopic dermatitis. Um, and as I mentioned before, you don't want to use any petroleum-based products for extremely premature infants. And this is because of the increased risk of coagulase negative staphylococcal infections in extremely low birth weight infants. Um, oils may also have multiple uh, benefits for neonatal skin care. This includes antimicrobial activity, anti-inflammatory properties, reduction of transepidermal water loss, and growth improvement. Um, oils with the lowest oleic acid and the highest linoleic acid had the most associated benefit. However, mustard, vegetable, and olive oil should be avoided as they delay development of the skin barrier. There's also numerous other natural oils that should be avoided um, for other reasons. Uh, for example, lavender and tea tree oil can cause gynecomastia in boys prior to puberty and should be avoided. Eucalyptus, sage, and tr tea tree oil can also be toxic depending on blood levels. And lavender, peppermint, and jasmine oil have been associated with allergic contact dermatitis and should be avoided. 
So more information is needed about the safety of products used on infant skin. We are sorely needing research on treatments and guidelines for premature infants. Um, and we need to have a subclassification by gestational age for these infants. So in conclusion, neonatal skin, especially that of preterm infants, is subject to adverse outcomes. Uh, risk reduction strategies combined with standardized evidence-based skincare guidelines offer the best known outcomes for this population. And any guidelines developed should be adjusted based upon gestational age. And safety and efficacy for infant skincare products is a priority. Wrong person I brought to back here. Uh, Missy, that thank concludes you so my much. presentation. So um, if we have any questions. Missy, thank you so much for sharing with us. I think it is so important for um, families and professionals to know uh, this information. Uh, I have a few questions for you, actually, because you mentioned uh, bathing and frequency of bathing every four days. Uh, and a lot of families ask us about that. Is this the same um, recommendation for after discharge? Yes. So in the especially in the initial period after um, you've went home with your baby, because if you bathe too frequently, um, you're going to get that dryness and roughness and flaking of the skin. Now, obviously, if you have an infant who you know, threw up all over themselves or, you know, they had one of those blowout diapers that we all know babies have and um, you, of course, want to bathe. So it's the recommendation is two to three times a week or as needed. Um, so if you have something like that happen, then obviously you want to go ahead and bathe and get that baby cleaned up. Okay, uh, I think the next question too is when the baby can then I see you, obviously, depends on the description of age of, okay, there's some noise on your computer. Yeah, I'm trying to move that away from there, maybe that'll help. Okay, that's better. Uh, when the baby is in the NICU, um, you, you make every four days, there's a lot of foam bathing in the NICU early in the days, not necessarily put the baby in water. I'm sorry, I missed that question. I don't know if it was because I was too close to my computer. Okay, no, my uh, my uh, question was in regards to uh, in the NICU, the way the, the baby is receiving the bath. Uh, in the early days, I think it's important to tell parents that the babies do not go inside a, ba a, a bathtub or a little container that baby can actually be in the water, but it's more like a sponge bath and parents get involved in that as well. Yeah, so our recommendation is always to get parents involved. And we don't typically put the infant in a tub in the beginning, but once um, the baby has gotten to the point where like they don't have an IV and they're stable, um, swaddle bathing is always recommended for that population. And parents are always welcome to join in that point. Um, swaddle bathing for that population is actually um, very relaxing for the baby, can be very enjoyable. And the baby doesn't have to be in an open crib or a bassinet um, to have a swaddle bath. They can still be in an isolate. Oh, that is very interesting. So there's a question here. Uh, if they develop a diaper dermatitis in the ICU, are they more prone to develop at a later age? I'm sorry, I missed part of that question. If a baby develops diaper dermatitis in the ICU, are they more prone to develop dermatitis at a later age? Um, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't. I didn't see any research that said if they develop diaper dermatitis in the NICU that they were more prone to develop it later on. I think some of the treatment that we do in the NICU can contribute to diaper dermatitis simply because. Miss, we are losing your audio. And that can contribute. Sorry, your your audio cut off, Missy. Sorry, we we lost your audio. Sorry, I was gonna say um, I didn't see a correlation between uh, the occurrence of diaper dermatitis in the NICU with diaper dermatitis later outside of the NICU. 
NICU um, just because there's things that occur in the NICU, such as antibiotic administration um, that can alter your gut flora, that can make you more prone to getting diaper dermatitis. And once, once an infant is at home, and no longer receiving antibiotics or the other things that may have contributed to the diaper dermatitis, you may see that clear up. Okay, and in terms of your other recommendations of dries and fragrant products, uh, barrier creams, and all the, they're not, not using petroleum based products, are all those recommendations also apply for the babies after this time, independent of the gestational age they were born? Oh, I'm sorry, I completely lost that whole question. I don't know what happened to our connection, but yeah, I know your audio is really bad. It maybe you can just hold your phone with your hand. Okay, is it better now? Mm, um, no, it's not. Uh, maybe I, I, I think the last, I think the last question is all those recommendations that you mentioned are they applicable for after this time? So independent of the station or age the baby was born? Um, no, some of them do not because the acid mantle barrier develops independently of your gestational age. So if you were born at 24 weeks um, or if you were born at 32 weeks, by that two to three week age period, you will have keratinized skin. Um, now, granted, a 20 24 weeker and a 32 weeker will be a little bit differently, even at two to three weeks of age. But by discharge, there's not really any different differentiation in the uh, um, the thickness of their skin barrier. That is great. Uh, I'm sharing the PDF email you're here. If people have more questions, they will send it to us, and then we can uh, reply to them. Okay. So okay, but I really want to thank you for joining us here today and share your information with us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And for all of you watching us here today and this entire week, either on Facebook or on our YouTube channel, uh, thank you for joining us. We have an international audience, people joining us from all over the world. If you missed one of the 11 talks that we had this week, you can watch the recordings on our YouTube channel or next week, they will be available on our website, which is right here, the Canadian premis.org. I want to thank our sponsors, Medilla, Water Wipes, and Prolacta Bioscience for their ongoing support. And also I want to thank our CPBF communications team, Patricia, Camila, Marianne, and Felipe for the hard work uh, to create this week uh, for us and uh, this incredible library of content that you've built uh, over the last year, actually. So CPBF is a registered charity and 100% of all our donations received this week, go to our support programs for families. To donate, you can go to the CanadianPremies.org. Together, we can create a brighter future to all premature babies and their families. And next week, I will resume our Premie Chats every Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can watch us live on our YouTube channel or Facebook. Thank you, everyone. I see you soon and stay well.